Ready to go? Uh, hey. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I hope everybody's having a lovely spring day, almost a summerish day. And I hope even more that those of you who are in Finland can have a vacation tomorrow and maybe also Friday and maybe even a four day weekend. Uh, I think I have to cut a little bit from my Sunday because I have a couple of master's pieces to read, but hey, three day weekend is more than a two day weekend. So, and the weather is beautiful. The chat is open. The lines are hot. What else? Uh, recording is on. Us lecturers are number, here. No, no. Mm. The number of uh, participants is increasing. It is increasing, yes. yes. But I'm sure the weather will tax few people. Yes, and maybe this Wednesday, there were some, some people who couldn't do it on Wednesday, but uh, let's hope that there will be as many as possible. Yes. Let's go. I'll put on the boilerplate and we are quarter past. Welcome. It is lecture number four. We are officially halfway past the halfway mark. And uh, for those of you who want to get rid of this course, this is probably good news. But for those of you who are enjoying the ride, it's getting close to an end. <laughs> we let you decide your own perspectives. We are here. Facilitation in depth. We have our super co-teacher Yari giving the lecture today. I will talk a little bit about exercise number three before that, uh, but I have promised to be done in about nine minutes to be precise. And then uh, the week from now, we are back on Thursday schedule, looking next week at tools and sprints and workshops and canvases. So how do you facilitate individual tools? And then it's going to be closing session. And actually, Yari, we need to sit down and think because what, and the way we do this is we actually look at what have you been giving, doing exercises, feedback, and try to kind of tailor the final session for you. Yeah, indeed. As good as we can. To the point, reflections and learning from uh, not drinking champagne, but the conditions for drinking champagne. So what we asked you to do yesterday is to search for the beautiful clarity in setting goals and objectives so if the old way of setting objectives whether it's a big project small project or whatever we have been drawing in onions you might have said something like this that the uh, yeah our objective our goal is that the number of users that use the new feature rise and new features cause no large issues to the existing users hmm. In my experience, that's probably something that you could probably come up in a product management or development or innovation scenario. Okay, as a facilitator, I'm hoping this is kind of putting small alarm bells ringing in your head, such as number of users rise. So is one user enough? What do you mean by this? And of course, the other question, you're saying that our goal, there are no large issues. Uh, so do we have a clarity on when does an issue become large or, or what do we mean by this? So of course the objective, the goal is that uh, after our dumb exercise, a good facilitator helps the people, the team, the organization to clarify them a little bit so that the goals are uh, much more, how should I say, they don't require so much interpretation. So maybe something like that. At least 30% of users have activated the feature and at least 10% of users use it on a regular basis. And one of the things I hope that looking at your exercises you returned this week is just to remind you, and this, I'm, I'm, this was very obvious in some of the cases, but in some of the exercises you returned, I wasn't sure uh, maybe we weren't, I wasn't that clear in telling how to use the dumb exercises. But the devil of this, the point of the whole thing is to facilitate. So if there's an old goal, the tool is the DUMB sparring questions, which are right there. So as a facilitator, or, you know, maybe you're looking in the mirror and asking yourself when you're writing down goals, are they doable? Are they understandable? And so forth and so forth. And then you write a new goal. And the new goal, hopefully, is much better than the old goal. So the dumb is kind of a catalyst 
it is kind of a it is a tool some of you used it so that you wrote down doable and then you wrote down a goal then you wrote down understandable and then you wrote down a goal mm, that's not really the way that i would recommend using it so the dumb is not the you know that's not the thing that's the way you use so you have an old goal and you have a new goal that is hopefully better and then when you look at the new goal you're kind of checking is this doable is this understandable is this measurable and is this beneficial so that's what we asked you to do um, a couple of really interesting things again popped up when, when looking at your reflections these are really these are really nice to read uh, almost wondering that should we just share them all with you nevertheless two things i picked up or at least two themes one uh, is this that the dumb criteria are quite subjective and if you have many stakeholders which you typically have you know for example the beneficial can be interpreted in very many different ways that's a great observation and that's of course absolutely true you know the goals are interpreted in many many ways and that's why we talk quite a lot about how do you do the participation or reification last week and another person said that this tool forces you to think that well, how would others understand this and that's really the point that's the whole point of the exercise how do we make sure that when we write down objectives other people understand so who are the other people typically they are the stakeholders uh, then two other things i think this was a really good point as well the tool may not be so well suited in fulfilling extremely specific or complex objectives this got me really thinking that if your objective is really complex is that actually a good or a bad thing and then the other people some people were reflecting that does this work every time because if this especially the measurability is forcing us to make things quantifiable that you can actually measure things. Uh, more than two people actually pointed out that you know there's there's certain chaos, there's creativity, there are things that we cannot see. So forcing things to become measurable, is this really a good tool in those scenarios? So that really brought me into mind another lesson learned from this. When we are writing down goals, and especially as a facilitator, when you're looking at other people doing this, are the goals is the purpose of the goals to communicate to people that we are you know going in the same direction or is the purpose of the goals to write down a certain state of affairs we want to be in six months or, or one year so to really you know, go deeper into this when we write down goals do we have this mindset that this is a fact that we want to be true at the given time and we're not sure it's really difficult to guess what this would be in advance especially in a new and a creative is this a law that we write down in paper and then everybody needs to follow it and it is in where complex objectives are okay because you know we are doing difficult stuff so the end result actually might be something complex and, and uncertain we cannot see the future and if we change these objectives all the time it kind of misses the point because we're trying to change the world into a new state of affairs. However, if we look at the goals as a communication tool, then things kind of are very different. First of all, when we write down goals, we try to make sure that everybody understands them. There's the whole reification participation process we talked last time. Uh, are the goals actually a vision that people can, you know, align themselves towards? Is it more of a vision rather than, you know, a law written on a piece of paper that tells you whether you get bonuses or not? And in this case, it should be understandable. You should maximize the understandability of it. And in this case, if the goal is very complex, then that's a really bad thing because it means that people don't understand it and you cannot align people to the shared vision. And then in this sense, changing the whole objective, that's the point. They evolve, they're dynamic, they're historical, everything we talked about last year. So to cut this thing short, as a facilitator, again, remember the division between, are you responsible for writing down those goals? 
Or are you the facilitator who's helping the other person to write down those goals? And in this course, mostly we are the helping people. We are the midwives. So as a facilitator, you know, can you please clarify to me whether you are, are we making these goals as a communication tool or are we making them kind of a, are we writing down laws or, or you know, piece of code that, you know, actually happens? And how do we balance between these two? So that's at least one thing I hope you kind of get at the next level from the exercise. And another one thing, uh, try to get, get this wrapped up in a minute. The M part, that is the difficult part. And that's of course what many of you said that the DU and the B are relatively easy. The M is difficult. And I already mentioned that. Why is it difficult? Here's our take. It is difficult because typically having something measurable requires actually a lot of change. The first one is that it requires change in the decision-making processes, because if something is measurable, that brings accountability into it. Something is accountable for whatever we write here. It also changes, you know, changes in our attitude. We might be wrong. If we write here and it's super clear, it really shows if we were wrong. There's data versus gut feeling. Is this a big issue? Well, let's see what our gut feeling says, or if you have a number, there's no room for a gut feeling. It either is or it isn't, and so forth. It goes into the actual technical infrastructure. Where do we get the measurements? Change, do you know, how much do we want to have interpretation in our objectives? Does the authority know best? And so forth and so forth. And as a facilitator, when we use tools such as the DUM, when we start asking questions that how do you answer to the M, the measurability, things like these start popping into the surface and you start seeing that what are probably the invisible obstacles that you didn't see before. Accountability, we might be wrong, and everything that was in the previous slide. And when you take the dumb tool and start the dialogue, I would say these are probably seven topics that might start popping up when people set objectives and you facilitate them to write down really good goals and objectives. That's it. That was exercise three. Uh, feel free to write comments in the chat while uh, we change the Yari slides. All right, thanks Risto and, uh, and, and uh, thanks for all, all participators uh, we have 167 uh, online so great that, that you chose to come despite the nice weather outside at least here in Helsinki so facilitation in depth uh, so this time we're gonna take a, a deeper or less deeper dive to, to, to facilitation as a social process. So uh, now from, from this tool approach, more on, on, on social side of facilitation. And uh, uh, what is our offering? What will be our offering today? So first we will talk about a little, little bit about facil facilitation, what's the definition uh, and, and what we talk about when we talk about fac facilitation. And um, then you have, a, Pretty soon, opportunity to share your own experiences so far in, in breakout rooms. And we will build on those uh, experiences to, to uh, talk about uh, facilitation process elements and, 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 and then about outcomes and versus experiences. After break, we will uh, continue to uh, discuss how we can add probability to be successful in our facilitation. And then there will be another breakout room discussion about your insights so far. And uh, you have opportunity to have a little dialogue exercise. And towards the end, the next assignment. And uh, the break will be around five, five o'clock and uh, we will end six o'clock as we have practiced so far. So hopefully you stay in, 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 in channel and uh, with us, uh, all, 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 all the all the way till six o'clock. So first, facilitation. What? 
so to facilitate it means somehow to enable uh, or the act of making something easier so it's it's kind of uh, making things smoother helping the process uh, and 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 uh, and and so and it, it of course has multiple meanings in various contexts but when we talk about the organizational context uh, facilitation is very much connected to different kind of meaning making or conversational processes how we can ease people to make meanings together or produce some ideas and uh, and and so it's 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 connected to decision making problem solving conflict resolution learning experimentation ideation development change transformation reflection and so forth and so a lot of conversational situations where we are aiming to produce something together and and so and that's 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 where the facilitation is can be as risto mentioned uh, it can be a kind of helpful uh, add-on in a way and of course wide variety of situation and settings so it's uh, it's not just uh, one kind of thing so and uh, situations can vary where there is uh, well let's say very positive and energetic enthusiastic highly positive innovation workshops for example or challenging organization renewables with strong emotions involved or even conflict conflictual situations uh, which i'm facing at the moment so uh, in the role of a facilitator uh, in, 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 uh, and, and so that's, that's, they are different, different kind of social settings. But anyway, there is a, a facilitator's role is to make it easier, make it smooth, to make, uh, he being helpful in producing such outcomes that are, are aimed at. And uh, of course, the, the setup can be few people, team, or even a pair in a way. As you have been practicing this uh, this facil facilitation exercises with 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 each other in pairs, or it can be several hundred people. Actually, this picture here in uh, this uh, lava picture uh, is is about uh, eight hundred people uh, uh, event which I was facilitating, and they had dialogue. What's good leadership in in their community, and and it was very interesting to see how how do, how we can create eight hundred people dialogue. And of course, it's mostly professional practices, but also we can uh, apply these ideas in our everyday conversations in a way, being more aware, more, uh, more uh, in a helping uh, kind of stance. And as, as Risto mentioned, that facilitation is helping. And uh, when we consider and take it as helping, uh, what are the kind of uh, characteristics or features that make it helpful? And first thing is, uh, which I would like to really emphasize, is neutrality, or at least relative neutrality. Uh, and, and in many cases, it's, it's, it's benefit if the facilitator is someone who is not so much involved by the issue and doesn't have any stake in, in what's the outcome of the process, but can be kind of neutral and asking asking good questions and and uh, help people to co converse and, and and discuss and and that makes uh, the facilitation in a way we can trust that he or she is really helping us in the, in the process and and not not really having a side uh, in uh, concerning the outcome and but of course in many cases we are in a way stakeholders as well and uh, and and that can be, a, can be a tricky part if you are not so aware that we are uh, we are kind of uh, trying to uh, or we have a certain idea what's the good outcome and then we start in a way uh, guide or uh, lead the process towards that outcome which we think is good one and uh, and, and and sometimes people are feeling that they are noticing it and and that can spoil the process that people are feeling okay this is more manipulation than the, the facilitation and so this neutrality is is one thing i, I, I we we should be um, we must be uh, aware of and from neutral position we can really keep the participants the organization our client 
responsible for their own questions. So it's their responsibility to get the answers and, and get the outcome. Not, and, and we are kind of helping hand in there. And then, so facilitator is someone who guides and enables the collective conversational process from neutral position. So keeping in mind the purpose, why are we doing this? The boundaries, what is belonging to this process and what not? And, and, and keeping up the dialogic interaction and uh, appropriate involvement, inclusion. So that's something I, 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 I see important. And of course, there are related concepts like coaching, mentoring, counseling, press consultation, which are kind of, it's kind of helpful, helping processes as well. And facilitation is in this family, it's, 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 it's a broader, you know, in a way, so it can be quite a big variety, but what's, what's called facilitation or facilitative approach or uh, kind of uh, role. But let's take our next uh, uh, next question concerning you. So uh, we are now going to our first breakout room. And the idea is to have a conversation in four or five person groups. What makes facilitation successful based on your experience so far? And the uh, idea is now to have an introduction round shortly and then tell your basic experience as a facilitator or as a participant because i know that there are people who are uh, maybe pretty experienced already as facilitators or maybe having some experience or none experience but i think most of us we have experienced some facilitation as participants and based on these experiences and your, your, your views and understanding, share your views and ideas, what all makes facilitation successful based on your current understanding in a group and write a short summary to chat. So take notes and when coming back, please uh, save it to, to the main session chat. And so this, this will be now next 15 minutes. So you have pretty good time for, for sharing and uh, uh, and, and be dialogic and, and summarize what are your ideas, what makes facilitation successful. And Kiara, you can now put people in groups and we will be back 10 to 5. I <laughs> think Melanie's idea about this is that I think it's about making more difficult to people and to activate their critical thinking. Well, that's that's one inter interpretation. Uh, I think in a bigger picture is make things easier. So, but uh, yeah, but, but I think that... one, one one tool to to uh, challenge people to think differently. So I, I would I would say say it that way. But my my idea was that it, it doesn't mean you know it might be painful. For people yeah yeah that's right it's not easy but in the longer run it might be easier you yeah, know? Indeed. Yeah. but i i think it's it's also making easier to encounter those uh, difficult questions and it doesn't mean that it's easy to, to encounter but it's easier if you don't do, do it at all but the mm. true facilitation they can do it but it's going to be made for most likely and not not difficult but compared to that that you don't do it at all <laughs> that's 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 then of course easier in a way but uh, of course, what is it? What is easier? Yeah, nobody asking tough mm. questions. Mm. But that's that's kind of having accountability. Yeah. Helpful thing. Okay, thanks for coming back. And uh, as I already said, so please uh, save your save save your notes to chat, and hope you had a good good conversation and uh, shared good ideas. And. Uh, and just uh, put them in the chat and we will come back to later to check check this after the break actually but i'd like to know, uh, pinpoint some some more more stuff concerning this there were uh, some comments in chat before the breakout room concerning the the neutrality and uh, and and so what's relative neutrality of course I think absolute neutrality there is very seldom, but 
at least we should be aware of our role. And, and there were some comments concerning the external consultants. Of course, they have their commercial uh, commercial interests and, and, and sometimes they, they want to push things to a certain direction. Uh, and of course, as facilitators, we have our own frames and understanding what's the right, right, right stuff. Uh, but still, I would say that as, as it was discussed in the previous lecture a bit, that uh, uh, as a facilitator, we should be in, uh, in uh, focusing on the process itself and the, that the participants should focus on, on the outcome and, and content. And, and so I, I think this, this, this kind of uh, work share, role share would be kind of healthy in that sense. But it's sometimes uh, challenging because we, of course, have a lot of knowledge and a lot of ideas ourselves as well, quite, quite often. But let us now continue a bit before the break, a few, few things I would like to raise. Uh, first, uh, this my approach here is, is more focusing on single event session workshop point of view. Meaning that that when we facilitate something, of course, we have that certain process in, in our hands and and, uh, and and that's important. But of course, uh, larger transformation as we are, if we are responsible for for large organizational transformation, uh, uh, this is kind of ongoing. It's quite often advanced and through single events and encounters. That's why I, I think it's important to 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 recognize that that. that that there is a certain boundaries with a certain process. But of course, that's then creating a larger process when there is a multiple such uh, uh, kind of facilitated process and, and workshops and such going on. But some uh, thoughts about process elements. Uh, one thing is, is the context itself. So it, every facilitation happens in certain contexts, whether in organization, network, ecosystem, or team, or whatever. So understanding that context is one thing. Uh, and, and, and this context always influence in the process as well. It's because there is certain cultural, uh, cultural features, uh, different expectations, there are certain situation uh, by large, and, and, and so on. And then each process should have a purpose and aims. Why are we doing this? If it's unclear, then it's hard to get any 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 good results. Or there's if there's quite diverse expectations, and if we don't clarify the, them, then then there are different different anticipations and expectations, and the outcome can be then argued whether it was good or not. But if we at start don't have a similar enough agreement of purpose names, then it's hard to get good results. Then, of course, good question is who should participate in this particular process. And, and quite often when we talk about organization change process, it's, it's good to have uh, all those who are uh, who, 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 who to whom might concern. And, and but of course, sometimes it can be 800 people or or uh, a little less. So meaning that 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 uh, it's good to have uh, all those who are involved in the in the in the situation or or uh, part of the team. Then choosing uh, methods and approach. So there's a lot of methods here uh, throughout this course, uh, uh, but there's several other uh, other good facilitation methods, uh, and and which one to choose, which would serve the purpose well and uh, how to really uh, kind of choose and construct right uh, serving approach. And then the facilitator is needed. So who is, who is uh, if we are, so are we neutral enough? Are we capable enough? Or are we experienced enough? Are we fitting as a person the situation and so forth? And, and finally, there should be some kind of outcomes and and uh, uh, some results but then what will come out is the experience together and we will talk about that a bit i would like to draw from this uh, connected this, this picture what uh, risto presented and introduced uh, last week 
uh, when we talk about reification and participation and the negotiation process, I would rename these things a bit uh, differently. I would say that reification represents some kind of outcome. So concrete results, documented canvas, some, some tangible stuff out from the process. Uh, and participation creates experience. Uh, and and, uh, and and that's another other result which has uh, 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 kind of uh, which is significant and, and important and the negotiation is 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 we can call it meaning making process so this conversational process and uh, when you now think uh, that this participation creates this experience uh, and uh, it's quite often that that uh, we can. This is something we remember, and uh, this experience. Well, I'm maybe a bit biased here, but because I, I I'm very interested in this. That that what kind of experiences should be uh, should be produced and and uh, enabled through 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 the process through the conversation, uh, and. Because that's that's something that that builds our culture, so it's not just the outcomes, the ideas, but it's the, the experiential part of the process that builds our culture further, and uh, and that is something because there's quite a lot of emotions involved quite often, or or it can be also bad experience. I was marginalized. I, I didn't I didn't feel I was I was involved in the process. So it can also reduce. Uh, our our commitment or or if if the process experience is bad and so that's that's why i i would really pinpoint both sides that keeping in mind that 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 if you are focusing too much in, in in outcomes and pushing them they can be they can produce bad experiences uh but and, and the other way around if you have a very good conversation but we don't produce anything that can lead to frustration as well so this is something uh, we, we should uh, be able to uh, maintain and, and, and nurture as, as facilitators. All right. Very quick thoughts, uh, but we will continue after the break because now it's five o'clock. We will have our break now. Don't go far. Five minutes. Five past. We will go deeper in, in, in this how to add probability for success in facilitation. Thanks for staying with us so far. That was great. I really liked it. That was a good lecture. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Really? Was it? Yeah. I always listen intensely when you. Yeah, well, this is something. I have to be very short, <laughs> short in my expression. So not really, but, but hoping to, to make it, make it a bit, uh, in infinitely Havoita after the break. Yeah. Yeah. That was, yeah. Got me thinking a lot again. <laughs> I'll go have a break as well. <laughs> All right. Let's have a little break.